you will listen to our distinguished guests, but this lecture is part of a series, uh, is part of a, a series in Arab studies. Middle East South Asia studies is an interdisciplinary program with a vigorous, robust uh, emphasis on comparative studies, and yet we also uh, reach out to different parts of Middle East and South Asia with specific, more specialized programs. We have Iranian studies program in that context. We have India studies program moving along the line, and Arab studies. We have been able to develop these programs thanks to you. So we really are in your depth because it is thanks to you, the community, with your help, with your guidance that we are able to do all of this. Tonight uh, we have a novelty, a bit of innovation. We have an a evaluation form. So if you could pick one up and fill it out, we would be most grateful. We would like to get your feedback on our events and keep that in mind as we plan more. And uh, without sort of taking too much of your time, I would one more time like to recognize Paris Said, a Palestinian entrepreneur based in Dubai who has a vision about bringing a sustainable life to Dubai, very much inspired by West Village. Uh, so we are building bridges from here all the way to Dubai with the inspiration we get from all of you. And in all of this, I also have to recognize one person, I mean, we, we are a whole team, a group, big, big group of people, but in them, there is one person who is very special, and that's Professor Swad Joseph. Without Pro Professor Swad Joseph, I wouldn't be here, the program wouldn't be there, these various initiatives wouldn't be there, so we are in her death too. Thank you so much, Swad. So, now, without further ado, I'm going to ask my colleague, Professor Susan Miller, Professor of History, a specialist on North Africa. Uh, she will introduce our distinguished guest who honored us by his visit to this campus today. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Baki. It's really gratifying to see such a nice, uh, large turnout, see the room uh, filled with uh, shining faces. Uh, very grateful to all of you for coming and giving our, our guests such a, uh, a warm and hospitable welcome. I'm very pleased to introduce to you our distinguished speaker for tonight, Prince Mouda Hisham Ben Abdullah, who comes to UC Davis from the Kingdom of Morocco. Muli Hisham is no stranger to these parts. He was educated at Princeton and has received a graduate degree from Stanford. He's remained attached to both of these <coughs> institutions. And today he's a consulting professor at the Institute for International Relations at Stanford, where he also serves on the advisory board of the Institute. But Muli Hisham's reputation goes far beyond academic circles. He's a figure of near mythic proportions in his home country, revered not only for his relationship to the revered uh, Mohammed V, his grandfather uh, and founder of the modern state of Morocco, but also because of his vigorous defense of liberal values. He's well known in Europe and the Middle East as one of the leading intellectuals of his generation, mainly because of his bold entrenching views on Arab affairs. Long before the recent turn of events in the region, he spoke out often on the subject of political and economic reform in the Arab world, especially eloquent on the topic of constitutional reform and governance based on popular participation and power sharing. His writing on contemporary Arab politics has enlightened readers of some of the world's leading newspapers in Le Monde in France, in Spain's El Pais, and Beirut's Al Hayat. But Mouli Hisham's interests go far beyond politics. They naturally reach into the areas of human rights and international peacekeeping. He served for the UN, uh, uh, with the UN in Kosovo, 
and is on the board of Human Rights Watch for the MENA region. Finally, as if all of that weren't enough, he's created his own foundation aimed at fostering, fostering innovative social science research in the Arab world. He also takes a passionate interest in problems of the climate change, the environment, resource management, and renewable energy. This morning, I sat with him in a meeting with Provost Hexter, and I listened with amazement as Mule uh, Hisham explained to the Provost the details of how to make a biomass converter. <laughs> this is truly a man for all seasons, a courageous spokesperson for the liberal Arab cause. We're delighted to have him here with us tonight, and he's going to speak on a topic that's very much on our minds. Year three of the Arab Spring, the winners, the losers, and those in between. Please welcome Muli Hisham Ben Abdel. Thank you, Professor Mira, for that very kind, very generous introduction. And with your permission, all of you, I would like in return to say something about Professor Miller. Professor Miller, before coming here, was at Harvard University, where she uh, chaired, where she led an effort centered around Morocco and the Maghreb. During that uh, tenure of hers, she has succeeded stupendously in making that venue an important center and an important beacon for the study of the Middle East, and in particular Morocco. More importantly, even if that funding was in part due to the government, Professor Miller has been uncompromising. And if you know the region, you'll know how hard it is not to succumb to all sorts of pressures, even if you're at Harvard, especially if you're at Harvard. <laughs> she has been absolutely uncompromising, flexible, but no compromises concerning intellectual honesty, concerning a transparent and free debate where Moroccans from all spectrums of society and political views can debate freely and honestly about their views in an academic setting. It was a real tour de force, and you are very lucky to have her. And I'm extremely uh, privileged to be responding to her invitation today and to be uh, with you all today. I feel very much at home in this beautiful campus. I had a wonderful morning with some of you, some of the students where we had a dialogue on the region. Uh, as you know, my talk today is called Year Three of the Arab Spring, the winners, the losers, those in between. Uh, the genesis of this this talk is actually an article which has uh, just appeared in the French publication, Le Monde Diplomatique. And here I have some of the ideas, of course, revamped and changed because things have happened on the ground, but represents pretty much uh, my thinking of where things stand at this particular conjuncture, even though things are very much in flux. I'll begin with a brief introduction. And I would like to begin with something that I urge you to keep in mind when you open your papers every day. And when you look at the Financial Times, or the New York Times, or the Monde, and you will read headlines, temporary headlines, and you'll be confused. Today happened this, today happened that. And in trying to make sense of this, I want you to keep this thing fundamentally in mind, this notion that the Arab Spring is not an outcome. It is a process. It's not a single event. It is a process. For those countries at the forefront of regional transformation, the fundamental question then is, can democracy become institutionalized? For me, the answer is a prudent yes. And a few countries are witnessing and are going through this process of institutionalization. Now, whether this spreads to other parts of the Middle East depends on many factors. Among them, religious tensions, political mobilizations, how these regimes are able to adapt to, uh, to face the street, and of course, the dynamics of geopolitics uh, in the area. Now, by institutionalization, what do we mean? We mean 
that these emerging regimes must uphold the rule of law and hold regular elections in which power alternates between competing forces at both the executive and legislative levels. Institutionalizing these democratic rules and principles is the most important task of these post-authoritarian regimes. And in the Arab world, the danger is not a return to the past old model of personalistic rule. That is to say, I think the age, for anyone who knows the area, the age or the era of the Zayim, who is a father figure, personalistic, or sultanistic in his way of governing and exercising power, usually linked uh, to a party or to the army, but only nominally, usually there is an ethnic group or usually there is a clan in the Asabiya sense of Ibn Khaldun. I think those days are over. That is not to say that uh, authoritarianism will not return in a way or another at different uh, stages. Rather, I would say that one of the dangers is the rise of the new authoritarian systems in which we don't have people anymore, but we have a ruling oligarchy which maintain a facade of democracy, but do not permit uh, a substantive and democracy of quality to emerge. And so you will have a kind of facade of democracy uh, by oligarchy. So uh, 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 that's one danger. The second danger, of course, is the rise of new populism. Now, I just said earlier that that you can't have personal rule, that you, it's unlikely you have personal rule in the same way. Populism does depend on people, on persons. Now, the memory of, of dictators, or autocrats, is still very vivid in the minds of people in the Arab world. But once that subsides, you could see a return of these type of personalistic regimes on populism, but they would be very different. Uh, and here, leaders would deliberately incite public passions, mass posturing, in order to undermine the rule of law and to monopolize power. So while the first model maintains the rule of law, but in, in reality manipulates it and subverts it, the second type of authoritarian regime confiscates it altogether. Either outcome precludes democracy. If you want to think of these types of models, you can either have a Hugo Chavez on one side, and on the other side you can have uh, somebody like, uh, like Putin who is not uh, you know, a populist and who has a whole, uh, embedded in a whole system of ol oligarchical interests. But right now, North Africa provides the most promising, at this stage, the most promising preview for democratic institutionalization. For transitional countries here have made the most progress in creating free elections, accountable parliaments, and drafting new constitutions. And as you know, Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt have experienced founding elections which with all their imperfections have been more competitive than those under their authoritarian past. Progress, of course, is uneven, it's chaotic, and sometimes, or most of the time, it can fall short of the mark. In Tunisia, the project to recraft the national constitution nears its completion, it's still ongoing by the Constitutional Assembly, Constituent Assembly, which itself was a product of electoral competition, as you know. And despite the emergence of diverse political interests, there is little instability. Today, I just heard before coming here that the government has resigned. Yes, these are spasms. These are, uh, are contortions along uh, a path, along a trajectory that is rocky. But all in all, nobody in the system would like to see the system derailed except for few groups uh, around uh, Salafi movements, who, contrary to Egypt, have not gone into the political game. In Libya, contrary to what you may think, uh, uh, the Libyan state is slowly coalescing and slowly emerging, and militias uh, have begun surrendering arms to the government. And finally, in Egypt, presidential elections, as you know, resulted in the rise to power of the Muslim Brotherhood, the Muslim Mohamed Morsi, once in office, Morsi, as you know, asserted civilian power over the military by dismissing Field Marshal Tantawi, General Sami Anan, and others. This is just a crucial a first step towards redefining civilian military relations. It's a crucial step. It's not the end of the story, it's only the beginning of the story. 
So in these transitional states, most political actors, except of course uh, some Salafis as well as defenders of the autocratic past, recognize this new reality and abide by it. Securing power now requires electoral contestation and political participation that is guaranteed under broader constitutional protections. However, we have to be careful about something when we talk about institutionalization, and I made this point earlier. The emergence of institutionalization does not mean that these democracies will become liberal. The Democrats of the Arab Spring did not embrace revolution to advance liberalism. Well, let me correct that. Those that ended up winning uh, power and taking power, namely the Islamist uh, groups, do not have liberalism uh, as the ultimate goal. And by liberalism, I mean generally what many in the West associate in the Arab context as advancing the cause of gender equality, unshackling censorship, uh, and otherwise widening the boundaries of expression. Liberalism, as I define it, is a body of political thought that gives preeminence to the individual and freedom. But I think it can only emerge at a later stage in democratic consolidation. As a normative framework, it will not emerge from the tenacious showdown in the streets uh, between secularists and Islamists as compromise on such nascent values is literally uh, uh, too early, I think. So on that, I will say a brief word about the Islamist uh, apparition in this context of the Arab Spring, or how it has emerged. We all know it's been a constant feature of our societies, but how does it factor in into the Arab Spring? And for this, it's important that we engage uh, 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 in more critical thinking. So Western observers in general are shocked to see Islamist parties in Egypt, Tunisia, and uh, 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 in Libya, less so in Libya, of course, movements like Nahda or the, Mas or the Brotherhood emerge as winners of revolutions they did not trigger, to, they did not trigger uh, in the first place. However, these fears of Islamization must be tempered by several realities. First, Islamists do not have a symbolic monopoly over the interpretation of Islam in the public sphere. In Egypt, classical Islamic schools like Azhar University frame faith and politics in different ways. There are, other, there are in Tunisia also Sufi orders which have a different vision of Islam and which differs greatly from modern or contemporary Islamist ideology. And even within the broad Islamist category, the Brotherhood clash with Salafists over major issues. Hence, Islamism is not monolithic. It's important to keep that in mind. And second, Though the Islamist trend is extremely diverse, the mainstream Muslim Brotherhood have not and are not a revolutionary vanguard. As the best illustration of that, the Brotherhood did not pick up the relay from uh, Ayatollah Khomeini's Islamic Revolution in the early 80s, calling for uh, Islamic Revolution everywhere. And in the same vein, they did not embrace Osama bin Laden's vision uh, to supplant or replace politics by globalized, uh, transnational jihad. And in countries where they operate in the political sphere legally, like in Kuwait and Jordan and in my own country of Morocco, uh, the official mainstream Islamist stance is one of gradual political reform and political change through the process, not violent overthrow of the state. And in fact, in many instances, they have run in elections where they knew the elections were rigged against them. In my own country, not only did they, did they accept to run, but they also accepted to limit their participation in the elections before, before this one to 50% of the territory. So they are imposing upon themselves, if you will, self-regulation to appease the system and to, uh, uh, to <clears throat> enter into a, a kind of uh, mode with the system, one of, of, of dialogue and one of uh, accommodation. Third, Islamist victories have hardly been sweeping. And that, in that sense, Islamists cannot be taken as the unambiguous uh, voice of the Arab masses. I will remind you that between the parliamentary elections in Egypt and the presidential elections, the Muslim Brotherhood lost 25% of the vote. 
And also, uh, uh, in the referendum, the latest referendum proposed by Morsi, they have essentially, they did not score, they did not do well. In fact, they lost the vote in, uh, in Cairo and barely won it by one point in Alexandria. So this is something very important to keep in mind. And they barely won or won not at a comfortable margin against who? Against Ahmed Shafiq, who is a symbol of the old regime, of the ancien regime. So this is just to show you that this is something we have to keep in mind, that they do not have the monopoly of the political discourse, and they do not have in these societies carte blanche. Likewise, in Libya, you have seen uh, the mediocre uh, performance uh, uh, of, the, of the Brotherhood there. They barely won 10% of the seats in the June 2012 elections for the General National Congress. Finally, many Islamists are being themselves transformed by uh, uh, the democratic bargaining, which is imposed by this process of institutionalization. And uh, I'd like to evoke uh, an important uh, uh, an important event which has really marked me. The uproar this fall over the anti-Islam film in America, I think, illustrates this pattern. The episode forced Islamists in power, whether in Tunisia or Egypt, to take a position, a clear position, uh, against its religious forces calling for violence. Furthermore, and this is even more relevant and more revealing, instead of employing traditional legal references to blasphemy or to hudud, which is scriptural in Islam, uh, for any insults against what Islam, or certain close interpretations of Islam, consider as sacred. Many Islamist leaders criticized the film by employing legalistic discourse that could engage contemporary international law, and this based on the principle of defamation of religion. Now, clearly, this is not going to have a lot of traction. In the, uh, in the world arena, in the intergovernmental arena, and into the UN. But the fact that they are advancing a, a discourse that is debatable and that is articulated around clear legal norms is something very new and is something we should and we ought to keep in mind. Uh, finally, before, uh, before we move on, the Islamists simply cannot take power by force. Egypt, for instance, the Brotherhood, is a well-mobilized social, uh, social movement, but simply it does not have uh, uh, the coercive means to stand in front of the military. Now, we've looked at one side of the coin. We can look at the other side of the coin, uh, secularism. What do we mean by secularism, and how is it used as a pretext in the political arena? Uh, to be fair, and to be com completely honest, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is no liberal liberal uh, organization. It has a conservative social agenda. It has uh, 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 programmatic uh, uh, organizational uh, 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 consequences of its own agenda in which you see the old guard still holding into power and excluding many of the youth in, these, in the Muslim Brotherhood, which shows that even in terms of internal democracy, things are not uh, ideal. So we should be clear about this. Uh, after all, the central message of many Islamists is to implement the pillars of Islam in accordance with Sharia. For that reason, many seculars are becoming fearful that should they take power, should they come to power, and they are in power, that the result is the establishment of theocracy. However, Islamist forces can, that's the other side of the coin, internalize democratic principles in a way that preserves their religious identity while still respecting the institutional laws and the electoral procedures. In sum, we don't need a cadre of Western educated liberal activists. Yes, that if they are educated in the West, be it, that's very important, but democracy needs to be something that has to grow from within the fabric of our society with our own uh, initial departing parameters. And remember, to think across settings, democracies emerged without Democrats in Portugal and in Spain in the late 1970s, and in the 1980s, the same of Latin America, uh, and throughout uh, the third wave of democratization as it unfolded uh, in the world. The core logic, and this is another point I want to make and I want to reinforce, is agreeing to disagree 
within an institutional ecology that abides by accountability and pluralism. Because the alternative is a perpetual stalemate, conflict, and instability. And these political actors are, uh, are pragmatic enough to understand this. In Tunisia, the mainstream Islamists in the government did not effectively uh, squash Salafist voices demanding conservative goals, rolling back uh, uh, women's rights. That's a counterexample. You can say, well, look, this is a clear instance. However, we must keep in mind that however liberal hardline, illiberal hardline Salafist activists are no different than other democratic forces or other forces in the region, workers, student unions, advocating their own interests, and we should see them as, in that uh, abstract sense too, as political actors seeking a strategic behavior. In Egypt, likewise, Morsi's recent effort to expand presidential authority does not symbolize an inevitable slide towards theocracy. His own concession, by limiting the scope of his newly self-declared privileges, reveals that he pursued not a timeless agenda of religious, a, a, religious, uh, a timeless religious agenda, but rather the more mundane task of monopolizing the discourse of legitimacy. The impulse to secure hegemony over power is not intrinsically Islamic or religious. It is the hallmark of any new unstable political order. And in fact, Egyptians recognize that. And when they talk about Morsi, they call him the new pharaoh. You don't hear him being called the new Ayatollah. Very different. Furthermore, the ferocious protests by secular youth groups also show that a vibrant civil society remains prepared to defend political pluralism. The situation in Egypt shows that no political actors can get everything they want on the agenda. The Islamists do not have carte blanche over politics given the opposition, and they know this by now. The secular opposition, though it can stand up to Islamists, does not also have uh, a, 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 a critical mass to weigh on the, on, on decisively on where things are going. And finally, the military is wary of interference. Not only is its interest protected by the new constitution, but it is regarded as part of the ancien regime, and there is a lot of written instances of going into an adventure of seizing power, because the military know that people will not take this. So, it's a, it's a kind of equilibrium that is based on the fact that people are ready to make concessions and ready to negotiate and debate, but nobody is willing to cede power for another group that will gain the monopoly of, uh, of power. And that's something very important to keep in mind. Uh, uh, yet, much as Islamists must cede ground to pluralism and diversity, so too will re liberal, uh, liberals realize that countries like uh, Libya, Tunisia, and Egypt need not be thoroughly democratized. Secularism is not a prerequisite to democratization. And in fact, this has been seen, and this is evident when you read the experience, when you read the, the history of democracy and its trajectory in the West. And much as uh, some are suspicious of Islamic fundamentalists who might deny secularism